Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to all. I'm uh, Jean-Philippe Steins, Senior Investment Officer with uh, the European Investment Bank, and it's uh, my privilege to moderate session 1.3. Our topic for this morning is the role of capital markets in supporting the development of the banking industry and economic recovery post-COVID-19 pandemic. We'll be touching upon different subtopics, including deepening the investment long-term long-term finance, the emergence of financial hubs in Sub-Saharan Africa, mechanisms for internal resource mobilization, and the eligibility use of proceeds criteria for green social and sustainability bonds. Without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our great panelists. We have six of them, so you'll get, uh, you'll get to hear very uh, different and enriching point of view this morning. Uh, our first panelist uh, will be John Esther. And John is a regional executive for DRC in West Africa at Trade Development Bank. Our second panelist will be Mrs. Vambui Chege. And um, she's an independent chair at Making Finance Work for Africa. Our third panelist will be Mr. Abraham Mianimbia, uh, who's executive treasury management at, Tra at Trade and Development Bank, TDB. Uh, number four will be uh, Jeff Odundo, who's uh, CEO at the Nairobi Securities Exchange. Number five will be Dr. Nathalie Schoen, who's principal consultant at Forma, Forma BB. And last but not least, uh, we have Mr. Mustafa Rory, who's MD at ProBank in DRC. I'd like to start uh, by giving each of them a chance uh, to make some opening statements. Starting uh, with uh, Mr. John Esther. John, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jean-Philippe. Uh, what I would like to do is basically to provide a backdrop, a snapshot of uh, where the capital markets are currently in Africa. Um, I have actually prepared a table that shows some data to give some context into the discussions that uh, I will be uh, going through and, and hopefully what will also ensue. Uh, to start off, let me try and explain what the numbers that I have shown actually represent. Uh, the country is pretty obvious. Uh, equity basically means how much equity has been raised in that particular market uh, during uh, its, its existence. Uh, debt means how much debt is being raised in that particular market. Uh, listed codes, number of listed companies in that market, bonds that have been issued in that market, and then what is that equity raise as a proportion of that country's GDP, uh, as well as the, the last column, which is what, what debt uh, as a proportion of GDP. As we can see from the data, basically, the, by far, the most significant market is that of South Africa, Johannesburg Stock Exchange, um, which uh, not surprisingly, is the most mature. That particular stock exchange started to support the mining industry in South Africa and has evolved ever since. Uh, South Africa also uh, had, uh, well, sometimes the, the benefit, if you say, of having been a closed economy for many years, and therefore it really depended on its own market to be able to, to raise uh, capital. So that's one of the reasons why it is probably uh, probably one of the reasons, I should say, why it is so far ahead compared to the others. Uh, the other one of note as well, I'm not going to go through all of them because you can see quite clearly what has been the activity based on, on the different uh, metrics that I have uh, explained, is Mauritius. Mauritius, because being, uh, despite being a very small country with a small population, is actually an investment-grade country and has the capability for raising um, foreign currency. Uh, and as you can see, that uh, despite the fact that it is not really uh, that old, has evolved quite well and has been very active compared to a number of much bigger markets like uh, Nigeria and Kenya, uh, raising $16 billion in, in bonds. Sorry, uh, raising 16 different bonds and uh, contributing currently 
23% of Mauritian GDP um, uh, as a proportion of equity, uh, GDP equity, equity to GDP rather, has been at the level of 23%. So pretty, pretty vibrant market. Um, the uh, other markets in Africa, there are other markets uh, what, that are relatively small. So obviously the financial services sector will have access to those markets as well. There's, there's Rwanda, there's Seychelles, all of which has got a number of listed entities and have been very active. But clearly, um, these markets are at various stages of development and evolution, and they are not all uh, obviously uh, capable of doing uh, everything that we would like them to do. Uh, so I do not really want to spend too much time going through those numbers because they do speak uh, for themselves. What I wanted to, to add was that the capital markets, as we heard this morning from Professor Ndungu, uh, would play a vital role in the uh, supporting the financial services industry and in particular uh, DFIs and banks because they have historically and going forward, they continue to act as the uh, conduit that allows investors to be able to connect with companies that are looking for, for finance. So I understand that we are a little bit constrained for time, so I would not take more time. I would instead like uh, to pass back to Jean-Philippe. Thank you very much, Donald. Thank you so much for helping us uh, set the stage and for uh, uh, being disciplined with time management. And without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Bambui Chege. Bambui. Take it away, please. Thanks. Um, thanks, Jean-Philippe, and thank you, Joan, for um, setting the stage and um, giving us the context um, to Africa. So this is a topic that's really close to my heart um, because I started out my career in international development, um, working with IFC, developing, designing, and implementing their first housing finance programs. And there, our goal was to um, work with banks actually to help them develop mortgage finance products. Uh, we took a programmatic approach. We also um, tried to do some work on the enabling environment to make sure that banks are able to get back their assets if if um, if there's any in the event of any default. And we also worked with real estate industry. And of course, the big challenge was always um, the availability of of, of long term money. And what really was the biggest issue was just how um, not deep our capital markets were. So at Making Finance Work for Africa, which is an independent initiative um, that sits at the African Development Bank, it's multi-donor funded. We focus on three key areas, financial inclusion, financial stability and governance, as well as long-term finance and uh, capital markets. For this specific session, I'm going to focus on our work in long-term finance and capital markets, uh, because I think that's what is of interest and relevance. Um, we have a really interesting um, initiative and program that is called um, the Africa Long-Term Finance Initiative. It sits right within AFDB. Um, it's jointly funded by FSD Africa, by GIZ through BMZ, and by the African Development Bank, and we implement it. Now, the objective of the initiative is to boost the uh, intermediation of long-term finance so that we can close the financing gap and our focus areas in terms of the areas which really need um, long-term financing is SMEs, um, infrastructure, as well as housing finance. And to do that, we've created two tools um, which are available to the industry. To everyone um, in this session, I really, really would like you to go back and just visit our website because we've got some really, really interesting tools. The first is a database and a scoreboard that provides data on key indicators on the development and the evolution of um, um, long-term finance market in, in each country. So what you can do is um, the indicators um, look at the sources of long-term finance. They look at the depth of the long-term finance market. They look at the uses of long-term finance as well as the enabling environment. So some of the indicators would be like private credit. It would be insurance penetration. 
would be the government bond market, some of them that um, John K. Esther also talked about, uh, protection of minority investors, domestic savings, foreign direct investment. And you then are able to create a spider graph that gives you the strengths and weaknesses of each country. And our hope and expectation is that policymakers will um, use that information to then make decisions um, that would help them uh, moving going forward. The other tool we have is we, following that, we are doing in-depth country diagnostics of the long-term finance market per country. So to date, we've done Ghana and we've also done um, Cote d'Ivoire and Ethiopia is in the works, but not sure now given what's going on in the country. Um, and the feedback we received, um, for example, from the Ghana Central Bank was really, 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 um, they really appreciated it um, as they were planning their strategy for the next few years, um, trying to figure out how they're going to address the issue of um, uh, making sure that uh, banks and investors have access to long-term finance. So I'm going to stop there um, and um, over to you, Jean-Philippe. Thank you very much, Vambui. I, I have to chip in a pers something personal here. I'm, I'm a huge fan of making finance work for Africa, and I'd like to invite all our audience to check your wonderful website out. It's uh, it's at uh, mwf4a.org, making finance work for Africa, if you want to Google it. It's it's wonderful and very rich with all kinds of information. Thanks. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, EIB is actually one of the founding partners of uh, Making Finance Work for Africa, and we're very proud about that. Uh, Abraham, it's your turn. Please, um, over to you. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Um, I'll focus on the role of DFIs and government in fostering uh, the bond market in Africa. Uh, the backdrop right now is that African economies are faced with increasing financing needs, while at the same time, the fiscal space is limited. They don't have enough revenues. So the bond market is a potential source of financing that will fill that financing gap. On the DFI role, I want to focus on three main things. We as TDB, see our role as a conduit between international financial markets and the region. We have sustained ourselves by maintaining a high credit profile, and this has enabled us to squeeze the best pricing in international markets and therefore be an efficient intermediator. This is a role that we see is going to get even more crucial because of the social impact of COVID. Social impact can only be alleviated by raising appropriate funding, and that appropriate funding is in the space of SDG bonds. The evidence out there shows that SDG bonds do attract a significant premium. That's a premium or a discount on pricing between a vanilla bond and a green bond. So we intend to capture that premium and be able to pass it on to fund bankable projects. However, as a DFI, we know our multifaceted role could cover more than just being a conduit. We can as well be a catalyst in terms of being an anchor to issuances in our region. By being an anchor investor, we've seen significant corporates in our region raising bonds on the local scene. Given our government backing and, uh, and credit profile, we could support these corporates to raise more debt and therefore deepen the markets locally. Similarly, we have the capacity to raise uh, technical assistance that would go towards enhancing capacity in our markets. Here I'm talking about facilitating the understanding of the role of capital markets, both at the regulator level and government level. There's still room to improve on the understanding of the role of capital markets in our region. And that can only be enhanced by capacity building and DFIs are potentially well-placed to do that. I'll skip on to go to the government role. Government has a fundamental role to foster a good investment climate that is providing supportive interest rate environment 
to allow issuances to take place at an optimal pricing. That requires a stable macroeconomic environment, and that's the role of government. If governments can sustain that discipline, there will be an impetus of people to switch from foreign currency denominated bonds to local currency dominated loans and bonds. And that is a significant step towards the framework for developing local capital markets. In fact, those, the evidence out there shows that those economies that are, are stable macroeconomically have well-developed or significant capital markets. Here I'm referring to economies like Kenya, Tanzania, and Rwanda is also emerging very well. So government has a role to play in safeguarding the economic environment to enhance issuances. Also, the policy framework has to improve. Regulatory regime has to be fair. Uh, investor and creditor rights have to be protected. So there's significant improvement on the institutional framework required. I wouldn't want to take much of your time, but I want to point out that at this juncture, where there is a huge deficit on the social spend, we as DFIs stand well positioned to partner with the private sector to raise capital both locally and internationally to fill the financing gap. I'll pause here to allow for more questions in the second segment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abraham. It's um, it's well noted um, what uh, TDB uh, specifically and what us DFIs in general can do to help capital market development and economic growth more general, more generally in Sub-Saharan Africa and in the region. Um, without further ado, let me uh, pass it over to uh, Mr. Jeffrey Odundo. Jeff, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, we are the uh, the largest exchange in the Eastern Central Africa region um, with a um, really commanding market share of close to, I would say, 80% of the regional exchanges. Now, um, when you think about what the complementary role between the banks and capital markets, and I'm really delighted that this session is happening, I think we're not in competition. We are actually in com we're actually complementary, and there are very, very different aspects of this. Uh, for start, um, for any business to access capital, they must have uh, cash in their balance sheet. They must have adequate equity in their balance sheet. It could be own source funds. It could be uh, borrowed funds within a smaller family group. But you must have your own capital before the banks can consider you credit worthy. And that's where the exchanges and capital markets become relevant because um, they are able to come in in form of equity that provide that long-term capital that sits in your balance sheet and enables you meet the, the credit uh, the credit scrutiny of the various institutions. And that's a very key role. So seed funding is one area that we think the capital markets plays a big role in helping businesses access capital. Now, on the other hand, uh, when you have the, um, if you want to, ex if you want to uh, help companies uh, access banking funding, then I think it's also important that for long-term capital, especially for, for, large corporates, then the capital markets become very relevant because you're able to raise either debt or equity on the capital market. And what, ha what happens is that then you reduce the crowding effect within the banks and allow SMEs and microfinance institutions access that capital uh, for, their for their working capital needs. So that becomes another, another key role. We also see the complementary role in terms of strengthening or providing funding to banks. Um, what's what we've seen in the recent past in Kenya, uh, a number of banks are raising money uh, in the capital markets for them to also on lend to to their, their their customers and we had good case, good use cases in Kenya where we've seen this happen and 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 very very uh good good outcomes coming out of it so we've seen a very strong complementary role between the banking sector and the capital markets and as the earlier speaker spoke i think there's a great complementary role there um more more interesting for us is even around the sustainable financing space. Um, Kenya is a trailblazer when it comes to sustainable finance. Uh, we were able to list a, a first private sector green bond in Kenya and in Nairobi and the LSC. And uh, we've seen great growth coming out of that. 
and that has informed the growth and development of capital markets. So there's a strong complementary role. Uh, the, 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 the sovereign debt market and also the corporate debt market in Africa is still very nascent. We have a great opportunity to, to enhance this. And I think uh, going forward, we should also just see how we can, we can be able to enhance this role through, through encouraging more and more cooperation and participation. I think significantly is that Africa doesn't trade with itself. Um, in, to, a, to a large extent. And, and we believe that things like the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreements and all these other partnership opportunities will enable um, Africa and hence uh, the need for long-term capital will be more than uh, required. So I think that's probably where I could uh, probably just give my opening remarks and just uh, open up this to uh, further discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jess. Jeff, for these insightful remarks and, uh, and, and highlighting the importance of capital market development. Uh, I'd like to pass it over. Time is flying, so I'd like to uh, pass it over directly to uh, Nathalie Schoen, Dr. Nathalie Schoen. Nathalie, over to you. Well, thank you, Jean-Philippe, and thank you, everyone who's been before me. I'm definitely going to have a look at um, that website, uh, Rambui, that you mentioned, because that sounds really interesting. Um, I'm, I'm just going to briefly talk about a, a part of the capital markets that are kind of still in development. Uh, I mean, there's been a lot of decline over uh, over the last year. Um, <coughs> Islamic finance. Um, and Islamic finance is gaining traction in Africa. There's 30% um, of the population of sub-Saharan Africa, which is bigger than what we're talking about, the region we're talking about right now, but it gives you an idea. Um, is Muslim. However, Islamic finance only makes up 1% of all the banking assets, which means that there is definitely a large potential out there. And we're seeing um, uh, the use of Islamic capital markets. Uh, Nigeria is, has just announced a, uh, a new government, Sukuk, being, um, uh, being issued or to be issued. Um, and it's very interesting if you look at what they're doing with that, because they have advertised where they're going to invest the funds and they're going to invest the funds in key economic infrastructure and that's a lot of roads um, as well as waterways and bridges so it's definitely for the economic good now Bloomberg uh, via the banker has said that the Islamic financial assets in sub-Saharan Africa are set to raise by 25% in 2021 that isn't as spectacular as it sounds because there was a decline in 2020 by 23.5%. So we're, we're still looking at a, a, a new increase. Now, why is this a good idea? And it's not just because 30% of the population is Muslim, although that does help. It is also because Islamic finance, by their nature, because of their underlying um, ethical standards, such as transparency, openness, equality, even gender balance, um, and economic prosperity and economic growth mm. fit very well with the, uh, the SDG goals. Um, mainly, if we're, we're looking at just some of the individual ones, number eight, economic growth, number nine, industry, innovation and infrastructure, but also poverty alleviation, um, good health, clean water, because water is one of the things that is obviously being invested in. Now the benefits for uh, for countries are that you can you can actually access it, a whole range of different investors by by doing this, um, international investors, but also part of your own population, um, uh, and then particularly thinking about Muslims. But I have to bear in mind that Islamic finance is not just uh, just just doesn't just appeal to Muslims; it can appeal to anyone, right? And that SDG part is 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 then a, a main attraction, um, the sustainability. The challenges uh, that we see with uh, issuing Islamic financial, and especially when you talk about larger bonds, is the requirement to have an underlying asset. And especially governments don't really necessarily have these assets anymore. Uh, so where do you find those in that case? And then the second part is... Um, you need to invest the funds in, in, in issues that are Islamic, uh, that Sharia compliant. Uh, so they have to meet the, uh, the, the criteria underpinning that. 
And that's not just a challenge for Eastern African uh, governments or institutions. That challenge goes across the world because we've seen that with the recent issue of the UK government, Cook, for example, where finding the underlying asset was the biggest challenge that they had, especially with the UK government not actually owning many assets anymore. Now, I'm going to leave it at that for now, um, just to see if there's any further questions later on. Um, so thank you, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. And back to you, Jean-Philippe. Thank you so much, Natalie. This is a really interesting angle you bring in here. And as I was researching our topic uh, yesterday night, I, I discovered that uh, Indonesia had become uh, a pioneer in issuing the world's first uh, sovereign green Islamic bond. So um, one definitely does not ex uh, exclude the other. And I think that's a really interesting pathway that um, we could explore perhaps if we have uh, a little bit of time left uh, towards the end. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to invite uh, Mr. Mustafa Roji to, uh, to please um, come in and um, tell us a bit more about DRC, presumably. Yes, hi, Jean-Philippe uh, and the team. First, thank you to TDB and EIB for hosting this conference. It is uh, indeed a very interesting topic, and especially when you come into the DRC context. Um, as many of you are aware, uh, the DRC is really at the nascent stage of having capital markets uh, developed. So in a way, it's probably one of the few jurisdictions left uh, where, where one can actually create um, a structure in order for capital markets to be enabled. Um, on the positive side, uh, as many of you have been following, the DRC is now under an IMF program. Uh, many reforms are, are underway and taking place. So it's sort of setting the pathway up uh, for us to be able to, or for our country to start creating the regulations around having an efficient capital markets uh, structure in place. Um, as our bank, Raw Bank, uh, the leading bank in country, um, saw this opportunity coming, we sort of set up a nascent capital markets desk within our organization. And the idea being that we tie up local uh, corporate borrowers that need to raise significant amounts of funding to savers who traditionally the only access to investment that they had so far were fixed deposits at banks. So we're now able to sort of offer them one or two alternatives or bonds issued in hard currency in US dollars for corporates locally. The idea is relatively new. So the first paper that we're working on is commercial paper that has a one-year duration um, for a mining company that's in operating in the Katanga province. Um, however, we see it as a start. Um, our sort of impulsion then created the central bank to, to sort of create rules around that. And they said, well, okay, great. You want to issue bonds out. Here are some basic regulations that we must follow. Um, so it, it's kind of like we're pushing things along um, in country. This definitely comes with a series of challenges, which I believe um, TDB and EIB with uh, your engagement with our relevant ministries and our regulators could probably help us commercial banks sort of move things along a little quicker. Um, and some of the challenges are really um, that there is a sort of uh, perceived risk, perceived risk. DRC is priced very expensive uh, when looking internationally inwards. So that creates a rel relative hindrance to attract capital abroad coming into the DRC um, because the risk modeling and the models that are applied internationally are somewhat of a dislocation to what local banks are offering in terms of credit lines. So we have, we're have we dealing with a, with a risk, with a difference in perception in, uh, in pricing based on risk models. Um, and that generally would discourage international money coming into the DRC. And so what we end up doing is tapping into local pools of liquidity in order to, um, to, to finance our corporates. I'm sort of exploring what, what could be done in order to sort of align that, dis, that perception dislocation. I mean, it's obviously a very a country that has had its challenges, um, but at the same time, some of the metrics are not too bad. If you look at the country's debt to GDP ratio, um, it's probably below 15%. Um, so there, there are, you know, it, it's sort of coming along and the, the metrics are not all that, uh, all that bad. There's, we've sort of seen a big push um, with TDB and EIB uh, coming on ground, taking the DRC, uh, looking at the DRC with a lot more interest. And I think that really helps things uh, along quite a bit. Uh, John, uh, who's, I believe, on this call, 
is a colleague from TDB based in Kinshasa. And, and we're sort of seeing a lot of very interesting uh, types of transactions being structured and hopefully will be closed very soon. So we're working with this sort of, um, we're, we're kind of working with this perception issue on one hand. And on the other hand, what we really need to build up also at our level is the knowledge base. Um, and I believe that uh, DFI, such as yourself, we've, we've seen the Rwanda sort of um, capital market sort of system just coming up uh, recently and they're making some very nice advances. Um, some kind of a bridge uh, created with one of our neighboring countries in order to extend the knowledge over to our regulators, or at least uh, ensuring that this is a priority amongst the various ministries that unlocking or creating a capital markets um, system or ecosystem within a country um, really unlocks investment and then powers uh, pow channels money in the right direction for collective economic growth. So if ever there's a plea I could make uh, to, our, to our friends who are very, very active and very looking at DRC with a lot of interest would be sort of in, in that direction on that side. Uh, in terms of um, so, uh, SDG bonds, um, this obviously creates, is, is obviously a huge opportunity and we, we can see it. I mean, with the Congo Basin being the second largest rainforest in the world and having read some of the news reports that came out of uh, the last meeting, the COP26 meeting in Glasgow, um, the, the Congo all of a sudden becomes extremely interesting. Um, in order to sort of make price, we sort of need our government as well to issue an international sovereign bond so that we could have some kind of pricing um, established for sovereign risk. On the back of that, then corporates could then rely on that sort of type of pricing to tap into international pools of, of liquidity. The government could quite easily come out with, um, if there is some way to monetize the carbon credits of the Congo Basin, perhaps that can be securitized um, into a bond that goes into protecting um, the, the flora and fauna and all of the, the, the Congo Basin, which is, which is an amazing, uh, amazing sort of provider of oxygen to the world, I would say. Um, so there's, we must look at DRC with, uh, with a lot of interest. I mean, I believe the opportunities are massive um, and we're, we're on the ground. Our, our bank has been functioning there for over 20 years and, and, and we've seen the growth. We do believe the next phase, the next step that we must take uh, onwards is to have a DRC sovereign bond that's internationally listed to sort of get a pricing in place if the, in order to get the pricing in a reasonable way it's securitized by certain assets it'd be an SDG bond um, it'd be very very positive for the country um, and we must bring in that knowledge sharing um, into 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 our institutions uh, of the DRC which I believe we're also very much open to now as the new government has come into place and is really looking forward to sort of internationalizing the context especially the financial framework in the country so yeah Thanks so much, uh, Mustafa. This is uh, very inspiring. I, I, I do take note of uh, your implicit invitation to find ways to uh, de-risk uh, some of the issuances. And uh, also in terms of supporting uh, SDG bonds issuance, including at the sovereign level. That is very well noted. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a great great fan of uh, the idea of finding a way to... Uh, monetized carbon carbon credits not only in the in the Congo basin in, in general but perhaps it's a personal favorite of mine in the Virunga park in particular but let's take uh, time yes. offline to, <laughs> to discuss this sure absolutely. Um, look uh, we're we're very little time left and we have a couple of uh, interesting questions from the audience that uh, I'd like to put to the panel one has to do with uh, diaspora and, um, and remittances, uh, which we know uh, has been a very uh, resilient uh, type of, uh, of source of uh, financing uh, in the region. And I'd like to uh, pick the panel's uh, brain about uh, diaspora bonds and what the, our panelists think is its uh, potential and, and, and perhaps ways to take that and scale that up uh, going forward. And there's a second question from the audience I'd like to throw in, which pertains to uh, the digitization uh, of uh, municipalities. And I'd like to stretch that question um, into uh, uh, a question about the market potential for municipal bonds in Sub-Saharan Africa, beyond the usual suspects perhaps, and also green municipal 
municipal bonds. If any of the panelists would like to speak with that, to that, I think it's a pretty uh, topical question. Thanks. And um, without any order, um, please uh, raise your hand if you want to come in and uh, speak to uh, either of those questions or make uh, complimentary comments. I see Abraham wants to speak. Abraham, the floor is yours. Yeah, I would like to speak uh, around the municipal bond opportunity. Uh, TDB, as we speak, uh, is structuring uh, municipal financing around uh, some major cities in the region. Uh, and we see this as a growth opportunity for the bank. There are some social assets that we will target and finance, supporting local government and the central government. However, where municipal financing has flourished, say in the US, there have been some tax incentives and other structural advantages offered to municipal issuers. So again, back to the role of government, governments need to realize that local finance through the bond market is a critical piece in public finance and giving it favorable tax uh, treatment for the investor will attract flows into that space. Also important to note is that there is need to develop capacity at the municipal level and, city and local government level to appreciate the nuances of municipal bond financing and the advantages of issuing or disintermediating banks and using bonds. So I see a significant opportunity and we have templates to, run, to, to learn from. There is the South African market, it's quite developed. We can learn from that and other major markets. So yes, the time is right to really boost public finance by raising either revenue bonds or general obligation bonds at the municipal level. Thank you. Thanks very okay. much, Abraham. Um, can I weigh in as well? Um, is, is John speaking? Jeffrey. Um, okay, Jeffrey, go ahead. Yeah, just to uh, pick up from where Abraham has left, um, I think municipal bonds, or what we call in Kenya county bonds, uh, is really the way to go. Um, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the current uh, stretch uh, financing structure we have in the national government, I think municipalities and counties have got to look for ways of reining on source funds. And in Kenya, what we see happening is, or the direction we've given them, is that they have to identify assets and uh, assets that have got adequate cash flow to support the issuance of these bonds, uh, see whether they can get rated so that uh, they, they give them a, a strong credibility and, and confidence to issue us to invest in them. Uh, we already have one county that has moved way ahead and uh, is now looking at getting clearance of national government to actually do a county bond. And it's going to be targeted towards uh, sustainable um, investments like hospitals and, and with the water companies, etc. So that's a very critical way. And that's the way to go, especially in a devolved structure uh, where you have principal uh, uh, centers of governance in, 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 in various regions. Uh, on the remittances, I think what's critical here is uh, getting in place assets that the diaspora can actually invest directly themselves. I think the culture we've had in, in Africa is where we, we have we, there's a high level of dependency on you remit funds to family and you expect them then to invest for you uh, in any property or, or other assets. But the stories are, we've had tell and tell again are very sad endings. And so once you have a clear access to investing directly in the market, have assets that you can actually identify and execute yourself, then that's helpful in, in, in creating uh, or increasing the level of remittances to support the growth of capital markets. And so in Kenya, we've introduced uh, products like real estate investment trusts. So instead of buying property, you can buy a REIT, which, is, um, which has an underlying asset in property. And that helps um, uh, provide safety of the funds you invest or when you're in the diaspora. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Um, for the sake of uh, gender fairness, I'd like to uh, see that Vambui has uh, raised her hand. Vambui, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, thanks. Um, I just want to talk about diaspora because um, 
um, like Geoffrey said, giving is big in Africa, um, but and there is huge, huge opportunity to harness all the money that comes in from the diaspora. Myself being once upon a time a member of the diaspora. And um, what we've done at Making Finances, we have something called the Diaspora Toolkit. So again, this is found on our website. But what it does is that it allows you to actually understand, uh, first of all, the diaspora networks that are out there. Um, you can also create investor profiles, financial profiles, understand how much money is coming in, and then where the opportunities are. Um, so that's one tool that's available, and it's also been financed by International Organization for Migration. The other area that I've seen work on is um, Ghana. Ghana has, has come up with a very interesting diaspora investment policy, um, which I believe they launched this year, and that's really to harness the power of the diaspora. And then there is something called the Remittance Grant um, Program, which was funded by SECO, and again, that is to harness um, investments for diaspora and channeling them to right um, investment opportunities, but also looking at addressing issues such as reducing the cost of remittances, um, which is a big um, investment impediment. Many thanks, and we uh, we have uh, one more panelist who's uh, raises his hand. John, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jean-Philippe. Uh, one uh, comment around the diaspora opportunity. Uh, I was previously actually based in, in Addis, looking after the Northeast uh, Africa region. And uh, we had various discussions with, with the government because uh, Ethiopia in particular had some serious uh, issues with regards to uh, availability of foreign currency. And uh, one of the uh, options was to consider a, a temporary shot in the arm by looking at opportunities for privatizing um, state-owned uh, enterprises uh, in which, especially the diaspora, because of their dollar flows, would be allowed to participate. Uh, in return, they would get other benefits other than being pure investors, like uh, benefits of residency, despite the fact that they were not actually here. So I think uh, what is critical in trying to tap the diaspora flow is uh, as Geoffrey is saying, is you you don't necessarily uh, uh, continue with the approach where investment is being made in in hand-picked assets, whether it's them or the families, where there is sometimes issues with the participation in the management of those assets, but rather to provide with the use of the capital markets and formal structures to provide the mechanism by which they can actually invest. Uh, directly in, in uh, companies that are being managed by professional managers or um, considering investments in portfolios that are being managed by professional portfolio managers. Uh, thank you. Many, many thanks, John. Um, time's flying, so uh, directly over to you, Natalie. I have a uh, I have some, some an, an observation about the green bond, and it, it also comes back to your earlier comment, uh, Jean Philippe, about the uh, Indonesian Islamic green bond. And one of the challenges with a green bond is you have to find things to invest in that are actually green, because otherwise, just labeling it, which, which I mean, I'm not saying this is the case in Indonesia. Um, but we see across the world that things are labeled as green and eco and SDG, but aren't necessarily. So I think that's one of the things to be really careful with. On the diaspora bonds, I or the diaspora investors, basically, I have a question um, to, to, to the other panelists, really, um, in that uh, one of the things that I've seen becoming uh, much more popular around, um, well, generally globally, is things like platforms where people can in, can pick a company they directly invest in. These companies are typically SMEs. Now, I'm not sure if that's part of Wambu's website, uh, but I, I am quite interested in that. Um, I can answer that question. Um, so the website, I mean, the, the toolkit is really more for government and treasury officials. But um, as well as um, organizations which would be then looking, for example, to develop something like a diaspora tool. How however, I have another client who is looking at 
developing um, and fostering giving by Africa for Africans. And one of the things that we have said they could do is um, set up, it's, it's not exactly crowdfunding, but very similar, um, where you give diaspora formal opportunities, great investment opportunities to invest directly. So I think there's this huge scope. The issue is not the money. The issue is investable opportunities. And also, I think, incentivizing um, um, Africans to, 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 to give more. So, for example, when you're looking at the issue and the area of philanthropy or giving, um, how is it that um, there's so much incentive for philanthropy to grow in and to be formal in, in, in the West and it's not here in, in Kenya, for example? Thank you so much, Vambui again. I, I don't see any of the panelists' hands raised uh, at this moment, but uh, feel free to interrupt me uh, if, if you um, have some uh, last comments to share. And uh, I don't see any further questions from, uh, from the audience. So uh, I think that's, uh, that allows us to uh, more or less uh, wrap up on time. I'd like to, uh, to thank all of our panelists for uh, extremely interesting um, remarks. I have to say that I've learned a lot today and um, that I'm um, more optimistic than ever about um, the, the different opportunities that uh, capital markets in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa are offering their respective countries. And um, my, my own bias was to come in with uh, the SDG bond uh, agenda. I, I still think it's it's a great opportunity if if one bears in mind that the SDG financing gap has grown by 50% just last year, unfortunately due to the pandemic, and it's reached 3.7 trillion dollars in the region. So the potential is definitely there. Knowing that uh, out of a, an issuance of 600 billion uh, USD in uh, in terms of uh, uh, green, uh, social, sustainability, sustainable and sustainability linked bonds, 600 billion globally. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has only issued uh, 3 billion, 14 issuers only. It's a, it's a great start and I think it's, uh, it's very encouraging, but it also points to the amazing untapped market opportunities there that awaits the continent. And it's tempting to think that uh, SDG bonds have to come as a cherry on top of the cake once your um, capital markets are, are fully evolved. But I, I'm, become, I'm becoming ever more skeptical of that. Um, the continent has shown its amazing ability to leapfrog, for instance, with uh, mobile money. And um, it's not unthinkable that um, green SDG bonds uh, could offer the twin opportunity of uh, channeling in um, uh, financing from the rest of the world, uh, perhaps uh, as uh, Mustafa encourages us to think about uh, by uh, adjusting uh, risk pricing with uh, first loss pieces coming from DFI and other the risking mechanism. And but um, also uh, to uh, a kind of front run capital market development, and as he also pointed out by uh, by helping. Uh, to uh, to pin down the, um, uh, the yield curve, uh, starting with the sovereigns, but uh, not necessarily so. Um, I also note that, uh, and thanks for the audience for those great great questions uh, that got got a spark uh, sparking. That uh, diaspora bonds and uh, municipal bonds are other tools, uh, other instruments that I can also uh, offer great potential, and I think the panel in general illustrated that um, when it comes to capital market development, one has to come a very broad view that includes, for instance, for instance, hukuk bonds and other uh, Islamic finance uh, instruments. There's just a, a very wide range of, uh, of instruments and opportunities that, that need to be uh, apprehended and pursued in parallel, not just, there, it's more about uh, breaking every possible venue to increase the flow of uh, sustainable finance to the region rather than uh, prioritizing one over uh, the other. I, I note now that we're only uh, three minutes from uh, our hard uh, deadlines in terms of time. I'd like to uh, 
go around the panel quickly. If there is a, like a snappy one sentence thing that uh, any of our panelists would like to end on, I'd like to uh, give them back the floor very quickly. Perhaps ladies first. I'll go first. Um, as, as we were talking about all sorts of things like, you know, incentivizing investors and everything else, the other thing that came to mind is the 2x challenge, uh, which is the, the, the gender investing. Uh, and I think some of those criteria can actually be reused to incentivize people to invest in or, uh, or companies to invest in uh, SMEs in a local area. Absolutely. Um, Go ahead. Uh, sure. As I was preparing for this session, um, some of the thoughts that, one of the thoughts that really came to me was that we've done really well um, countries like Kenya and other countries on the continent, as you said, leapfrogging and um, um, getting as many people as possible to the access to finance agenda. So financial inclusion is a big deal. But if we really want uh, financial markets to play the developmental role that they're supposed to play, we have to move to the next thing, which is to deepen our capital markets and make sure that mm -hmm. finance is available, because that's the only way. If we can grow enterprises, if we can grow our infrastructure, um, if we can make um, housing affordable to people, grow their assets, um, then we will take our countries to the next level. Otherwise, then we'll just always remain at a shallow level. Thanks very much, Rambu. Gentlemen, I think uh, you're being challenged to uh, to come up with something uh, very insightful as well. Okay, uh, let me go. Um, I think uh, one of the things that we should not forget is the role of the governments. Um, I think African governments have have a further have a parenting role to ensure capital markets grow, uh, and that's important because um, they provide the catalytic effect. So we need to see more involvement of government in capital markets are using the capital markets to privatize companies, to raise capital through bonds and, and, and sovereign debt and green bonds in order to encourage the private sector to also play a role. So the catalytic effect is so important uh, and even in terms of policy and incentives in order to encourage the growth of capital markets so that we can actually be able to grow as one has said and become relevant to the economy. I think if you look at South Africa, 260% of GDP is amazing. I think Africans, I mean, other countries can actually uh, reach there, but we need strong government parenthood. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Jean Philippe, if I may, if I may jump in fairly, fairly quickly Please. here, I, I think one of the one of the key um, prerequisites is is basically financial literacy, uh, and this is one area where uh, governments uh, can, and uh, central banks and other uh, leading regulators can play a very critical role. I was very pleased to hear what my Congolese brother at Raw Bank is doing with regards to presenting other investment opportunities, uh, including investments in bonds uh, to help raise debt for uh, corporates in the mining sector. I think this is a classical example. If people are used to, because uh, this is what they, they historically have been uh, made to understand, they need to be presented with other opportunities. And, and a lot of that will actually come from being fairly literate about the uh, opportunities that exist once we get our act together in our respective countries. Thank you. Thank you, John. No? Who's speaking? Abraham. Go ahead, Abraham. Yeah, I think Africa is well poised to leverage technology, uh, as we've seen in some of our countries like Kenya, to really take capital markets to the lowest level of investor. That's the retail investor. I've seen this work in Kenya, and that's the only way we can really deepen our capital markets and localize our infrastructure financing. Technology is the future for capital markets. Thank you. Mustafa, I think you're the last one, but not the yeah. least. Please, uh, absolutely. I, I think I'm down to zero seconds, so I'll be brief. Um, and now that I have the audience uh, with our colleagues, especially TDB and EIB, 
um, doing things in in uh, in difficult landscapes where where nothing has been done before, like in the DRC, is usually a lot harder than working on deals that you traditionally see in your organization see coming out of areas like Kenya or Ivory Coast or Senegal or South Africa for that matter. But if I could just plead to all of you in your back offices and your credit risk guys and the hard, the stuff that's harder to do is the trailblazing stuff that will really have an impact. So if I could just send that plea out to you, to, to all of you in your organizations. I think these are great words to uh, to end our panel on. It remains uh, my duty to uh, thank all of our panelists very much for their yeah. insightful uh, remarks indeed. So, uh, John, uh, when we, Abraham, uh, in order, Ab Abraham, um, Jeffrey, Natalie, and Mustafa, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Shokran. Thank you. Uh, I wish um, all the participants to. Uh, our Banking Academy, a great day and uh, a great few panels to follow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, merci. Thank you.